On May 8, 2022, we began a sermon series on the Psalms. Two and a half years later, we are still in the first book of the Psalter, and this morning we will work through Psalm 30. We are 20% there, church. We're doing great. Now, a lot has changed since 2022, and I'm constantly joyed at the new faces I see in our congregational family each and every week. For this reason, I thought it would be wise to explain why we think it's important to preach through the book of Psalms, and also explain how and why our communion service looks a little bit different. You'll notice I'm preaching. Usually the preaching comes at the end. Why is that? Well, let me explain. The simple reality is that the book of Psalms has been the central worship book in God's people for the majority of church history. Psalms were sung weekly. Psalms were read. Psalms were memorized. All together as the corporate body of Christ gathered. And I think in our modern, consumer-driven model of ministry, we have drifted away from a psalm-centric view of worship because the book is just daunting. It's long. It's daunting. We like our sermons expositional as long as the book is short enough to get through quickly. And maybe you even feel that pull or that tension as we conclude 2 Samuel. How long have we been in this book? Are we done yet? Please, can we do like an 8 to 12 week epistle next? But there's good reason the church has always rested in the book of Psalms on its Sabbath worship. Here it is. The Psalms teach us how to live. They teach us how to worship. They teach us how to approach suffering. The Psalms show us as humans that every human emotion is okay. It's actually critical to who we are as created things. The Psalms teach us to love. They give us a God's eye view of the world and everything in it. When times are tough, they teach us to persevere. They encourage us onward in our faith. And they teach us a whole lot about Jesus. So I want to encourage you to read the Psalms in your private worship. You can get through the book of Psalms twice a year if you read a psalm a day. And that's like giving yourself two months of grace. Right? 300 out of 365 days in the year, read a psalm. You can get through the Psalter twice. Now, a second change that has gone, uh, that has come with this, is preaching, preaching the book of the Psalms, these short homilies on the book of Psalms, trying to refocus in on such an important book of God's Word, is also how we connect it to then communion, the Lord's Supper. Now, the Lord's Supper is one of the church's sacraments or ordinances, the two things that Christ clearly prescribes the methods of worship he gives us in Scripture. The other one, of course, being baptism. Jesus commands us that we would gather and feast together in remembrance of him. So when we do gather and take the bread and the juice, usually on the second Sunday of every month, we make all of our worship lead up to that celebration, which is why we are spending time in in the psalm right now to prepare our hearts for the Lord's Supper. Now, Greg will explain a little bit how that's going to work. If this is your first time here, we're so excited that you can gather and take communion with us. Greg will explain a little bit how we're going to do that. But for now, we have an opportunity to be in God's worship book. And I want you to know that this book is important, beautiful, and instructive. So here is Psalm 30, church. A psalm, a song for the dedication of the temple of David. I will exalt you, Lord, for you lifted me out of the depths and did not let my enemies gloat over me. Lord, my God, I called to you for help and you healed me. You, Lord, brought me up from the realm of the dead. You spared me from going down to the pit. Sing praises of the Lord, you his faithful people. Praise his holy name, for his anger lasts only a moment but his favor lasts a lifetime. Weeping may stay for the night, but rejoicing comes in the morning. When I felt secure, I said, I will never be shaken. Lord, when you favored me, you made my royal mountain stand firm. But when you hid your face, I was dismayed. To you, Lord, I called. To the Lord, I cried for mercy. What is gained if I am silenced, if I go down to the pit? Will the dust praise you? Will it proclaim your faithfulness? 
Hear, Lord, and be merciful to me. Lord, be my help. You turn my wailing into dancing. You remove my sackcloth and clothe me with joy, that my heart may sing your praises and not be silent. Lord, my God, I will praise you forever. Let's pray. Lord, help us see this song rightly and sing it out in our lives. So Spirit, search us, transform us, and help us see Jesus this morning in your name. Amen. The inscription of the 30th Psalm gives us context that is to be used in the dedication of the temple. Now we know David couldn't build the temple himself. It was his son Solomon who would eventually build the temple. But you can see David's heart in wanting to sing a song of dedication to the space in which God would dwell. So more broadly then, this is a great psalm to use during worship in general. And I think David's song here does three things for the church. First, David invites the church to praise God for his saving grace. Hear the words again, verses 1 through 5. I will exalt you, Lord. You lifted me out of the depths and did not let my enemies gloat over me. Lord, my God, I called to you for help and you healed me. You, Lord, brought me from the realm of the dead. You spared me from going down to the pit. Sing praises of the Lord, you, his faithful people. His praise, his holy name. For his anger lasts only a moment, but his favor lasts a lifetime. Weeping may stay for the night, but rejoicing comes in the morning. What a beautiful story. David is rescued by the Lord and delivered out of the hands of his enemy. Now, oftentimes, scholars like to categorize each psalm into certain types. And while that can be helpful, they sometimes go overboard. Uh, But today, I think it's safe to say that our psalm that we have is a testimony psalm. David is giving an account of something God did for him. A mighty deed. Salvation right before the enemy succeeds. Victory when things are looking dim. Now it's helpful to have gone through First and Second Samuel as a church these, this last year and a half because we can see the multitude of stories where maybe David is thinking uh, when he writes this. He's looking back to the time when the Lord rescued him. It's the lens in which this psalm gives testimony. Many times David is in need And the Lord spares his life when all appears lost. So David is giving testimony. And I feel like the application, right, is pretty straightforward here. The Lord does a powerful work in David's life, so David encourages believers to praise God for rescuing him. That's verse 4. Sing the praises of the Lord, you his faithful people. Praise his holy name. And the command to praise God is both Sandwich. So verse 4 is sandwiched between the first three verses, which give a testimony for what God has done, and then we get verse 5, which is David giving us the character of who God is. So why do we sing praises to God? Because of what he's done and who he is. Listen to verse 5 again. Actually sit in verse 5. Live in verse 5. For his anger lasts only a moment, but his favor lasts a lifetime. Weeping may stay for the night, but rejoicing comes in the morning. That is the God who we serve. That is the God who we sing praises to. So David, taking what is true in his life of God's redemption and what is true about God and his character is encouraging the church to sing praises to him. We'll return to this idea that weeping may stay for a night, And joy comes in the morning in a bit. But let's talk about this invitation to praise God as the church. How often do we use our testimonies, the stories of God working in our lives, not just our conversion stories, but maybe even what God did last week, how often do we use these stories to genuinely invite others into worship? I think that's a good question to ask. The application is straightforward. Go and do likewise. But we must also ask ourselves the motive question. When we share our stories, is it for the glory of God and God alone and the exhortation to worship, or are there ulterior motives? I think a lot of hashtag blessed, the handle on Twitter, where basically people are gloating at all that God has done for them. See, we live in a navel-gazing, light comet share culture that is constantly reminding us the lie that we are masters of our own universe. If anything is good that has happened to you, 
It is your own doing. And if it is from God, we can give him a little bit of credit. But it's really about you and what you've done. This me-centered movement is one that ultimately is incompatible with biblical Christianity. Our Savior gave his life for us. But that's okay, right? Because God's design for our thriving is so much more beautiful and holistic than what our culture peddles and sells. But be warned, Christian, the air we breathe, this is the air we breathe and the water we drink. And as I've been working through a growth hour on technology these past seven weeks, and we've, church, been trying to navigate the world we live in with wisdom, I think that the, the process of actually giving your testimony, that, te- that believers would give their testimony for God's glory, is totally an embodied task. Let me say what I, share what I mean by that. What I mean by that is the internet really isn't a place for us to be doing this. The application here isn't go post about what God has done in your life. On some occasions, God uses your testimony online for great things. Here's the truth. I've seen it in my own heart. The things I post, even if I and when I use God language, are often for the dopamine hit and not for the true edification of his saints or the mission of God in the world. God can and do, does use our presence online, and we should think critically about what that looks like. But I think true Christian testimony is an embodied reality. Now, I'm being kind of super negative with this statement. I get it. So let me state it positively. What are we doing in our actual gathered life as the people of God to point each other to worship? When we serve together, are our words words of life and testimony? Do our small groups create space for the sharing of story and the communal response of worship? What would it look like for Hope Church if our presence every week was not just checking off the spiritual box, but for the actual sake of one another, especially those who are younger than us? Communion Sunday is this horizontal, there's this horizontal reality we talk about it, the vertical and the horizontal, where it's not just about worship, it's also about uh, loving not just God, but one another. There's a horizontal reality where we're coming together as brothers and sisters in Christ. So this psalm is a perfect communion text. How are we encouraging to one another to praise God? Are the stories that we share stories that are life-giving and challenging us to, to live for Jesus? Or do they serve a different purpose? Share your stories with one another for God's glory. Second thing. David confesses the pride that led to his downfall. Verses 6 through 8. When I felt secure, I said, I will never be shaken. Lord, when you favored me, you made my royal mountain stand firm. But when you hid your face, I was dismayed. To you, Lord, I called. To the Lord, I cried for mercy. What is gained if I'm silenced? If I go down to the pit, will the dust praise you? Will it proclaim your faithfulness? Hear, Lord, and be merciful to me. Lord, be my help. Now, verse 6 highlights the incredibly human nature of the Psalms. While this this psalm bookends with confessing God as a great redeemer, we see contrasted in the middle here the stubborn, sovereign self. When things are going our way, we tend to equate our successes to our own efforts, gifts, accomplishments, intelligence, charisma, etc., Not only do we testify to God's goodness in a way that robs him glory, oftentimes we don't even acknowledge his existence in the first place. Maybe you've done this before where you pray really hard for something and then the Lord is gracious in giving you this good gift and then your prayer life looks absolutely different after you've gotten what you've received. You maybe stop communicating with God completely. Now we've talked about this many times before Our culture likes to view God through the lens of self-help. He's nothing more than a cosmic butler, divine therapist, genie in the bottle. Think about that with me. What a bold move to use an infinitely great, holy and just, sovereign creator over the heavens and the earth to do my bidding in my life and to make me successful. This text gives us a hint at how truly... Deep sin can creep into our whole beings. Even the man after God's own heart 
looks at his prosperity and safety and then boldly proclaims, I will never be shaken. David is human just like you and me. But even in this confession, we see David's personal relationship with God. He recognizes immediately that he was rescued by God and it kind of was his own doing. His sin and his rebellion and his not realizing who God is led to his downfall. It was God's sovereign decision to remove his hand and his face from David. But then he responds to this truth with some of the most relational prayer in Scripture, and it's honest. And I think there's a lesson here. This, uh, the second thing, I'm giving you a, a third lesson, but it's still under the second point. This one's free of charge. David teaches the church in these verses how to pray boldly. David uses, he knows what, he, he uses what is true about his God and the covenant promises his God has made to him, and he makes a petition to God in a bold manner. Maybe you, when you first even read the text, it almost felt irreverent or egotistical. David saying, what is gained if I am silenced? As if God truly needed David. But what we actually see here is a bold prayer that is a conversation. A conversation that is based on a deep understanding of who God is and what he promises and how secure David is in his, David is in, is in his covenant love. And maybe the this is the antidote to using our prayer as a divine needs. An image of what genuine relationship with God requires. It encourages us. It gives us a vision to pray boldly. We can petition the Father. He will hear us. We can speak to our Heavenly Father with faith. So once again, the psalm sings out, Go and do likewise, church. Third, David teaches the church that God works redemptively through our trials. We're given such a beautiful ending to this song. In a real sense, a reimagined chorus from the opening lines. Here's verse 11 and 12. You turn my wailing into dancing. You remove my sackcloth and clothe me with joy, that my heart may sing your praises and not be silent. Lord my God, I will praise you forever. There's a good chance we need to hear these truths this morning. There's just been so much loss in our congregation. As Jonathan shared, the staff has even used the language of season of grief to describe where our church is at. What a beautiful text to hear after three funerals in eight days. Our wailing will be turned to dancing. Weeping may stay a night, but joy comes in the morning. As I was walking into the church this morning, it was a beautiful sunny day, and for whatever reason, I noticed the window that we have on the lobby, the painted glass that's above the carport. And for what today, God wanted me to see, it is this image of the sunrise. It is like even the lobby of our church is singing out this song to us today. That no matter what you're going through, the sun will rise. Joy is coming in the morning. No amount of suffering in this life is eternal or never-ending. God always has a way of turning our darkest seasons into gardens. And just as David sees God's hand in his rescue, we have the truth of God's word to guide us through the hardships we face with courage and faith. Think with me as we come to a close on this homily about the gospel. What the darkest night in human history means for us as believers gathered around a table today. That God would give up his son to the pursuing enemy. That God would send his son to the pits, to use language of this psalm. That death would fall on the word of God, Jesus Christ, just so that you and I could have freedom. So that when the sun rises on that Easter morn and the stone is rolled away, we can sing with the disciples and the church from every nation and generation with joy everlasting. He is risen. He is risen indeed. Our sackcloths of sin and strife have been washed clean in his blood. Behold, 
He is making all things new. This vision should help you through whatever trial stands before you. Know this. God hears your weeping, and he weeps with you. But also know this. God will one day wipe every tear away from your eye. He has promised it. God will give you joy. So I don't know what you're going through. But Psalm 30 instructs us. It promises us. It comforts us. It feeds us with the truth that our God will never leave us. He will never forsake us. And all the hardship of this life will someday go away at the sunrise of the resurrection. Rest in that church. Sing praises to our kind king. Pray with me. Lord, we are in a season of grief. And there's so much loss, both the loss that we know and the loss that isn't even been communicated, the losses that we experience deep down inside of us that we're too afraid to share. But Lord, you are a God that is so big and so gracious. And I thank you for rescuing David and I ask that you would rescue each and every one of us from the snares of the evil one, from the lies that hold us down, from the sickness that is invading our bodies. Give us victory. And help us be a people that proclaim you in boldness and sing out so we know what our future holds. So I thank you that you will turn our weeping and wailing into dancing and joy. And I ask that you would graciously bring us that healing and victory soon. In your name, Jesus. Amen.